right, okay. Um, as Andy said, we're here on Earth Day. Um, Earth Day is in its 51st year, um, first started in 1970. And each Earth Day, in fact, pledges a different theme. And uh, as Andy said, today's is restoring the Earth. And I'm sure that most people who are on this call will understand that fundamental proposition that actually we generally, in this world of ours, are using far, far too many resources. Exactly how many resources uh, is shown in this chart here. If we think about operating within Earth's environmental limits, we also have another day in the year. It's not a standard day, um, but it depends on the nature of your country, the day. And this overshoot day is when individual countries have exhausted the capacity of the earth. Now, obviously in an ideal world with the uh, calendar year starting at the beginning of January, we would not exhaust the capacity of the earth at the very least until late December. And in fact, as we see, there are only three countries in the world, Nicaragua, Ecuador and Indonesia, that are not exhausting the capability until that time. On the other side of this chart, you see something absolutely terrifying. Qatar has exhausted it in February, as has Luxembourg. And if you then look at uh, beyond the Gulf regions, you see Canada and the United States of America have exhausted capacity by March. And we're, we and New Zealand are there in the middle of May. Now I'll be sharing uh, these slides later so that uh, anybody can have a chance to have a look at them. But this is actually an absolutely horrifying picture particularly when you see all the developed world over in the top uh, or at least the middle of the right hand side, exhausting the capacity of the earth for everyone else every single day of our lives. And therefore I have to say for me, net zero is not an option. It has to be zero because zero is about understanding the emission reductions that we need to take in terms of moving forward. And that does mean an absolutely radical rethink of policy in the context of looking not only after current generations, but future generations. And there's a danger if we only think about future generations separately from current generations, we'll end up in the same um, dislocation of policy whereby people cannot act on climate because they're not seeing it um, affect them in their daily lives. But actually, if we are gonna save some of the world for our children, our grandchildren, and those not yet born, then actually this is the decade in which we need to act. Now, Andy talked about the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. And I just need to say, it didn't come out of nowhere. Actually, when Wales first became a National Assembly in 1999, Uniquely, we were given a duty to promote sustainable development in everything that we did. And as one of the first assembly members, and particularly initially starting as deputy presiding officer or deputy speaker, and therefore one of the two guardians of the rules of the organization, this was very important to me as an environmentalist um, and as a social justice activist. But what we found over our journey over the next decade was that no matter how much you wanted to put it at the heart of government, and um, I tried to pioneer this approach at the end of the early 2000s, um, it lacked definition. People did not know what sustainable development meant. And even though we signed up to the Brundtland definition, which most people interested do know, the definition where um, in terms of supporting current generations, you don't compromise on the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. How you interpret that was different. And therefore, when I left government in 2011, I left with a specific proposition that if Wales was serious 
promoting sustainable de development was not enough. It had to deliver sustainable development and government had to do it and government had to be bound by its own law to do it, as well as all the public services. And that is what underlies what is now the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. Not just the traditional environmental, social and economic pillars, but also an incredibly important cultural pillar as well, in terms of driving behavior at all levels and creating a new balance between these very important pillars rather than the economic pillar winning out into short-termism as it has done historically. Here are the goals in the act. You saw them in the integrated circle. The role uh, of the goals is not to look at them individually, but actually to integrate outcomes. So for example, when I was able to introduce the recycling targets in 2009 with financial penalties, that now means that for at least two months last year, Wales was the best recycler in the world um, and is competing for that top space with Germany and Singapore, then that meets a number of goals. It meets a goal in terms of um, uh, enhancing biodiversity, not least because of, we have not only not building any new landfill, which was one of my um, initial uh, reasons for taking forward that approach, um, but actually we now know that by 2023, Wales will not be using landfill at all. So a journey that was started in, in consultation and collaboration and partnership um, in, the context, in the context of 2007 ends up uh, in 2023 as a journey that will be no new landfill in Wales, no, no landfill in Wales. So it's really important that we think of long-term approaches that can cross governments and that does require regulation or law. So you'll see why I'm speaking, uh, while I'm speaking, that these seven goals are integrated. New definitions for prosperity, as in low carbon and innovative, within environmental limits, creating opportunities for decent work, not just maintaining, but enhancing biodiversity, although I wish this one was called the nature goal. Health, not in terms of targets for ambulances or waiting times, but how do you look upstream? How do you maximize the opportunity for physical and mental health? And similarly with equality and uh, supporting the very strong communitarian approach in Wales, how you protect language and culture and heritage. And all of this in the context of that Think local, uh, uh, act, um, sorry, think global, act local vision, whereby a globally responsible Wales takes account of its effect globally in terms of the actions it, it takes. And when you think of Wales as being at the heart of the Industrial Revolution, the place where the first million pound cheque was signed in the Solic coal exchange, you can see this is a very different proposition to usual. The Act also contains these five ways of working. You have to think long term, you have to be preventative, you have to integrate your outcomes, you must collaborate with each other, and you must involve people about whom decisions are being made. And these two elements together make up the core of the Act, those seven goals, those five ways of working. And then that's overseen by <clears throat> three different mechanisms. Obviously the government will oversee its own public services, but the government will also be held to account by the Future Generations Commissioner, independent of government, um, who has some substantial powers in calling out poor behavior. By the Auditor General for Wales, who audits all the public services and has had to change the way they audit to reflect these new systems. And obviously by the courts, if people are dissatisfied either individually, collectively or organisationally with the impact of individual organisations or the work of the Commissioner or the Auditor General. And importantly, this has, and I was astonished to find this, um, to find that as a result of passing this law, and although I proposed it, it was others after me who passed it, it was the incoming then National Assembly when I left, it is the only country in the world 
that actually has a mechanism to deliver on the sustainable development goals. And there's a clear match between the individual goals and what they match in the sustainable development goals. And I think importantly, in the context of the dialogue that we're going to have today, and we want to bring it back in the context of the built environment, I think it's almost important to sort of return to first principles here. There was a pioneering government after the war. And it wasn't just about the fact that that was a Labour government. There was also um, a legislation passed during the war in the context of education. And then we had the big incoming um, changing government in the context of social justice, in the context of providing council housing, um, uh, for example, uh, in the context as well in terms of clean water. Think about what happened in the war in terms of digging for victory and the effect that had in creating mixed farms. Now, <clears throat> if we think about the role of governments across the world in looking after the fundamental elements that keep humans alive, air, water, food, shelter, all of those are the same for any creature in nature. We all need them, but of course, as humans, we also um, need aspects of you know, sleep, clothing, that's unique to us in the sense, but we all need reproduction. Every single aspect of those physiological needs at the moment is under threat. And yet we are living in countries which have expanded so fast without thinking about the effects on the natural environment, air, water, food are linked to the natural environment, that we now have very poor air quality. We've got real problems with issues around clean water. And only yesterday there was a report about how much sewage is dribbling out into our water systems. And we know the agricultural effects on our rivers, for example. We've got very poor water. We've got very poor air, although we've seen it improve during COVID and we need to be able to sustain that. We're not <clears throat> growing the food we need in this country. In Wales, only 3% of our fruit and vegetables is grown here and yet we have the capacity to do it because we have a lot of space but much of that land is negatively affected by pesticides the slurry runoff another big problem for um, uh, in the context of water in shelter what are we building when I was minister uh, back in 2009, I created a coalition of the willing about low zero carbon building. And I was able to introduce one planet developments that are still alive to, uh, uh, today, where people can build in the open countryside if they can demonstrate how they can meet half their income needs from the land and in doing so live in zero carbon accommodation. And there's nothing else like that in the United Kingdom. But until very recently, we still were producing high carbon building in Wales. We were producing pattern um, uh, book building, when in fact, the number of organisations that are delivering on low carbon uh, building outcomes was still relatively small. And something that I was trying to address in 2009 was not addressed until two years ago, and very much because of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. And how can we move up to those, and without those physiological needs and safety needs being met, that health, that employment, the, the personal security, the safety that comes with property, whether owned or rented, how can we move beyond that in terms of our relations with our community, our esteem for ourselves, our self-actualization. These are absolutely critical elements in terms of how we create better societies. And what the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act enables is a value system that underpins every decision where those public organizations paid for out of the taxpayers' money are publicly accountable and can be held to account by both those auditors, whether it's the Future Generations Commissioner or the Auditor General, but also by the people of Wales, by the people of Wales calling out their public services. So it's a very good framework. And since it's been passed, we've seen a number of really interesting um, pieces of legislation, whether 
you see the anti-smacking legislation or um, <clears throat> giving rights of voting to 16 to 18 year olds or whether it's looking at the new national curriculum or whether it's, it's outlawing that bad practice in the context of farming whether it's looking at the creation of a national forest whether it's looking at um, using a potential national nature service in terms of the conservation and reconnection uh, in the context of the environment uh, when we look at new um, laws and regulations around sustainable building elements, you're seeing quite a change now all the way through to um, organ donation and presumed consent. So there is an, a very much a change as a result of the values framework driving it. So my simple proposition in the context of being given this opportunity today on Earth Day is say, let's turn it round. As Andy said at the beginning, where do you start? But if you start with, get, with governments adopting a values framework that means that they hold themselves to account and cannot make bad decisions, that's a very good place to start. That's the story that the book tells, uh, along with 140 voices from across the world about why other countries should be doing this too. And as you'll see at the top of the quote, in 2015, uh, the UN said what Wales is doing today, the world will do tomorrow. Well, it might be a long tomorrow, but I'm delighted that Lord John Bird sees the most, the best way in protecting um, and mitigating against homelessness in Wales and new social justice provision is to have future generations legislation so that all public authorities are held to account to do the right thing for current and future generations. And I look forward to being part of the panel to discuss this further later. Diolch